name's Steve McCarthy, and this is Freedom Is Not Free. This, story, this show is not uh, named Freedom Is Not Free by chance. Our freedoms, often which we take for granted, have been paid for in blood during wartime and by everlasting vigilance in peacetime. Each of our veterans, whether a combat veteran or serving during peacetime, made an important contribution to those freedoms which too often we take for granted. My next guest, Dawn Levine, chose to volunteer for military service after World War II and served with honor in the United States Navy. Dawn, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, Dawn, uh, off camera we were talking about uh, growing up in America and uh, what it was like many, many years ago. And in passing, you mentioned that you did not have the, should we say, standard uh, home experience growing up. You were actually raised by your grandmother. Right. Well, what was that like? It, it, it was different than having a mother and father. She couldn't read or write, but she took beautiful care of me. I remember in the wintertime when I had to go to school, she used to take me on a sled. It's very emotional to me. I, I'm not to get tears in my eyes. I, I get really touched with this. But she raised me until I was about 17 when I wanted to get away from home because I could, didn't have the luxury of a mother and father. So I, got, I finally found my father to sign for me and I enlisted the Navy. Certainly uh, it, it sounds like your grandmother did everything in her uh, power to give you a warm loving home. Um, this is Detroit uh, where you grew up. Yes. What was Detroit like? You, you hear so much uh, negativity about Detroit now. What was Detroit like growing up uh, pre World War II? At the time I was growing up in Detroit during World War II, Detroit was not known as it was as it's known today, the murder capital of the world or whatever it is. We had no locks on the doors. I used to come home at night, just open the door, go into the house. No air conditioning, no 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 conveniences like 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 it is today. We had no TVs, had radios. I remember listening to a story called the Hermit's Cave, where you shut the lights and you hear a squeaking door that would scare you. But it was wonderful growing up. My time growing up in Detroit was wonderful. So certainly a a, a simpler existence. Uh, all the things that we think are essential that you didn't have then didn't really matter. Exactly. No air conditioning. Unbelievable from then till now. Now, you were in your formative years uh, during World War II. Um, do you remember having any impressions of what wartime America was like? I knew it was a, tra a terrible war. When, when you heard the news and everything like that, nothing was good. We lost several islands, and it was, it was killing me. And I was very emotional about that. I wanted to get into the service so bad that I, that I couldn't wait till I was 17 to get my father to sign. It was, it was just that at a time that it was ending, World War II was ending, but officially it wasn't over until the beginning of 46. So when I went in, my service was wonderful. Okay, then, uh, of course, the Germans surrender in May of 45. Um, the atomic bombs dropped in August of 45. The, the, the official uh, surrender documents were initiated in Tokyo in September, and then, as you said, uh, the, the full peace wasn't executed until 46. Exactly. At that time, uh, most Americans were looking forward to having their loved ones leave the service and, and come home rather than go in the service. Exactly, and leave. exactly. You're a 17 year old young man, and as you said, you were anxious to leave home. Um, did you feel like uh, after the the, the Japanese surrender in, in Tokyo Bay, did you feel like you got cheated a little bit, the war was over? Or was it more like, well, 
I'm glad I didn't have to get involved. No, it's, it's 17 at that age. I would have liked to have seen action. I would have really liked to see action. But I'm happy the war was over and our boys were coming back home. So I served whatever time I could serve, not knowing that we're going to have other wars in the future. I just wanted to put my, my time in as, a, as an American. And I think that's a very important point because too often we take peace for granted and it can just be an illusion. Um, why the Navy? Why not the Army or the Air Force? That's a good question. When I at high school, there's four of us got together, four of us friends, and we all decided the Navy for some reason or other. So we all went in together. So we all went to boot camp together. Okay. Now you you headed off to Great Lakes, North we of all, Chicago. Yeah, we all headed off to Great Lakes, Chicago. What was Great Lakes like? And uh, well, let me start this way. When what time of year did you take basic training? Do you remember? Winter time. It's pretty cold. It was, it was cold, in yeah. Uh, do you remember what an average day of training was like at Great Lakes? What, did, what were the kind of things you learned? In? Well, getting up early in the morning, to be honest with you, I, I can't really recall doing exercises all kinds of activities but there was a time when we after we were finishing Great Lakes I remember going into a, a hangar or something like that but everybody take an IQ test okay to see what you're suited for is it just a seaman or to go to school if you were chosen to go to a school that was a wonderful thing which I was one of several like there was like eight or eight of 200 that went to school. What kind of tests, uh, these IQ tests, did, did they, um, were they testing for ability in certain areas or it was a general? Just general, general, just, I have no idea why they chose me for what I was chosen for. Nor did you get an opportunity to say, no, I didn't want to do no. that. No. <laughs> um, you're actually chosen to become a radar. Exactly. How much did you know about radar when they said you were going to go to radar school? As much as the man in the moon. Okay. In a, in a fairly new technology just really um, exploded during the war years, during World War II, how important radar was going to be. So they ship you from Great Lakes to uh, a couple of different schools, one in Rhode Island and one in uh, the, the, the Boston. First, the first one was Point Loma, San Diego. Okay. What did you learn at Point Loma? They had all kinds of equipment there, and we used to go every day, six to eight hours, learning how to operate this equipment. Now, when you say equipment, uh, these days uh, equipment is miniature miniaturization. Uh, can you describe how big some of these pieces of equipment were that you were working with in '46? This is the age of vacuum tubes, well, isn't it? Yeah, we the, the the scopes, the scopes were like when you see on the airline. What do you in the airline tower where they have the scopes? Right. They're a little bit bigger than that. They weren't that much bigger, but we had to calibrate them ourselves and do everything ourselves. They didn't have like. Everything is preset or something like that. We had to learn how to turn it on, calibrate it, learn how to use it, how to read the distance of where the objects are. Nothing like pinpoints right now. You just turn it on and it just shoots itself off. Yeah, and that was, this was all in its infant, infancy and you were kind of learning as you go. Exactly. How long were you at Point Loma? I got it right here. Seven weeks at Point Loma, San Diego. Okay. Was that the first time you had beyond boot camp? Were these the first times that you had left Detroit? Yeah. Flight? Okay. Um, Point Loma was pretty nice duty, though. That's... It was beautiful. And then they shipped you from there to Rhode Island? Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. What were your impressions of Rhode Island? 
And now you've, you've seen the West Coast and the East Coast. I was having a good time at 17. I never left home before. So I was actually having a wonderful time of my life. Going to school, having liberty at night, get, getting rated. I always, I always wound up with a 4.0 rating. So I was really, to be honest with you, I had a wonderful time. I love working with my hands. If you give me something to read, how to do something, I, 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 I could never find what to do. You show me one time what to do, and I'll do it. So, and again, very technical training, but you you seem to excel at that. Your, your grades were always top notch, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, they don't give you liberty unless, unless you're doing something exactly. right. Exactly. Uh, then you make a final stop for additional training at the Fargo building in Boston. We had training also called CIC, Combat Information Center. Those were those big charts that you used to plot the ships, uh, objects, where they are, how fast they're going, what direction they're going, how big they are. And the, the, the CIC is really the heart of the ship. That was the heart of the ship. Um, you completed that training in Boston? I went from Boston, then I also went to Philadelphia. Okay. Some and training in Philadelphia. For, for additional training in yeah. Philadelphia. So uh, combined, you had had a lot of uh, technical training before you actually went out to the fleet, should we say. Exactly. Now, you successfully complete your training and you were assigned to a cruiser. Now, what makes this kind of unique is um, you were a member of the first crew there. Ex exactly. Uh, for our audience, can you describe what a cruiser is like? The kind of armament, uh, yeah. roughly the number of people. Well, on all it. I can remember is the big guns were eight inch at that time. Okay. And then they had the anti-aircraft guns. I had memorabilia. That would, all the guns and everything, but they were lost in the moving, me moving from city to city. But uh, I remember the radar, if I remember correctly, we were four decks below was where our radar room was. Being, just... being put on a ship that's being commissioned for the first time was, and never being on a ship like that before was the most exciting thing. And I, I could just remember just just in awe, just ex how big. Do you remember roughly how many people are in the ship's company? If I remember correctly, 2,000. Okay, so, and we're talking about a new ship, so we're taking 2,000 people from all over the Navy, some some like yourself coming straight from training, some from the fleet with, with more experience, and they're thrown together to form a crew. Um, what what kind of training did they give you on on the ship to integrate that crew? Well, we 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 used to stand watch, radar watches four hours on four hours off. It was all brand new equipment and everything, so we were in training all the time. We we're aboard ship. We were at training. We went when we commissioned the ship. If I'm getting ahead of you, let me nope, know. You, um, just briefly, could you describe what the uh, what the radar room looked like? You said you were four four decks down, so obviously you you have no viewpoint outside. The radar room was dark all the time. I would say this is like in a room like we are now. The screens were lit up, and the room was dark, and we did all our work in the dark, except where they were doing the the plotting had lights on the table where you could. See see the plotting charts and everything. But we were on watch four hours on, always learning brand new things. Now were you plotting both aircraft and ships or one or the other? Aircraft and ships. And ships. I remember names of some of the radars, SG and SR. I have no idea what they stand for, but that, I remember the, the types of radar we had. Were you uh, were you at all over? This is kind of overwhelming. I'm thinking about your age. You're probably 18 by now. By the time you get to the ship, did you find any of it overwhelming, or was it just a, 
a great experience. It was a great experience and overwhelming. To find your way around a ship, it took you time. Where you get lost once in a while. There, I, I can't explain in words what the experience was when I got aboard that ship. Okay, so as you said, you had the fairly unique experience of, of being there when she was headed out for her shakedown cruise. Exactly. Um, for our audience, just explain what you're attempting to do during a shakedown cruise. Well, we didn't know exactly what we were going to do. We were all young kids. They told us we're going to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So we went to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and we were anchored there for a while. Then we sailed off. We were, they went to test the guns. They were shooting at uninhabited islands with the eight inch guns. Then they were shooting at an airplane that was hauling a sleeve behind it to test the anti-aircraft guns. When you went to Guantanamo Bay, did you get any liberty? Yes. What, what was your uh, uh, experience or impressions of Guantanamo Bay? Guantanamo Bay is like a summer resort when we were there. The grass was green, tuna fish sandwiches, I remember, were 10 cents, Cokes were nickels. I don't smoke, but cigarettes were 13 cents a carton. And they only had one place to go in Guantanamo Bay, it was Guantanamo City, which had a little train that went back and forth. But every other day it was quarantined because of VD. <laughs> so every other day they put it off limits. They put it off maybe. limits, then they open it up back and forth. That's an experience that I'd rather not even talk about. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so you, you did get to um, uh, see some of the Cuban culture while you were there. Then you went off to uh, on shake the continue shakedown with with the guns several few weeks what's it like to be on a cruiser when they let loose with those eight inch guns well I'll tell you I remember one time I was aboard on deck when they shot off those guns I almost busted my eardrums but they didn't they did hand out earplugs after that but it was it was an experience that I, I you'd have to see for yourself you can see on TV on the guns that shoot off on these battleships. It was just un unbelievable when they shoot off these guns. And we're talking 12-inch guns, so they're firing a shell that's a little bit bigger than a Volkswagen. Eight-inch, I think, if I remember correctly, we had eight-inch. Eight-inch, okay. They were, they were big. They certainly are. Um, now, you mentioned also that you not only uh, firing your main guns, but you went off and tested all your anti-aircraft guns yeah. also. Um, explain to our uh, audience how you do gunnery practice for aviation. That's <clears throat> that's when they had an airplane towing a long sleeve behind it. Right. And you would shoot at the sleeve. Now, but some of the gunners got too close to the airplane, so the airplane called back and said they're leaving, they're not going to come back. So they had other ways of shooting those guns off. That's also a good way if you're sick of gunnery practice to get it to stop too, is shoot at the plane so yeah. you won't come back. <laughs> um, do you remember, did the ship have any particular problems or would you term it, term it growing pains more than anything? I don't remember any problems that I can remember. So really, it, it was, if they found anything serious, you didn't know it. We didn't know about it, exactly. And we never, we were never stuck anywhere. No problems that I could recall to this day. In total, how long were you on board? I'd say about eight, nine months. Okay, so after the shakedown cruise, where, where did the ship go then? Well, I don't want to make anybody jealous, but we went to Port-au-Prince, Haiti for a goodwill tour. Okay. Then we went to Kingston, Jamaica for a goodwill tour. Just okay. getting off and meeting people and having just having a ball. Now, uh, Haiti, of course, is probably the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Jamaica, in those years, was still a British Crown colony. 
Any particular impressions as a, as a young man on liberty in either place? We just had a good time. We went to, I don't have to tell you, we went to bars. I don't drink. I may have had a beer or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we met people. And we just schmoozed around and had a good time. We only had a few hours every day on the, on the islands. But it was, it was very interesting. So you went, you went to Port-au-Prince, you went to Jamaica on, on uh, Goodwill. It sounds like it was a successful mission, at, at least from the cruise standpoint. They had a good time. Everybody had a good time. Uh, in total, how long did you serve Norm in the Navy? Close to two years. Did you ever consider making the Navy a career? I did, but I, at that time I just wanted to get home. Uh, after two years. First of all, I've never left home before I went into the Navy. I served my two years. I was happy, almost two years. I wanted to get back home and see what kind of life I could have back home. Okay. After those two years, you, you, you get discharged, you go home. How had home changed? And how would you change in those two At that years? time, I was almost 19. My grandmother was living in her was living alone. So I moved in with my grandmother. I got a job. I helped support my grandmother. And eventually, I'm going ahead of myself. Eventually, a few years down the line, when I got married, about five years after I got out of service, I got married and I went to television, a school called RETS, Radio Electronic Television School. Went there for a year, night school, while I was working on another job. I graduated. I started on TV business, working at night, $2 service calls. <laughs> after, after a year or two, I quit my other job. I built up my TV business until about 19, till about 15 years ago, 19, I can't recall until about 15 years ago from now. I wound up having a beautiful TV business. I wound up with about 4,000 customers, had a great business, made a nice living and everything. So would it be fair to say that some of the technical training that you learned in the Navy prepared you for that kind of work? And absolutely. Um, how do you think you had changed as a young man? As, as you said, at 17, you were just I, I got to leave home. I, I, I got to go see the world. 19, you come back. What did you think of yourself? I just grew up. I felt like a man. I had a job. I bought my own car, took care of my grandmother. I, I don't ever remember getting into any problems like some kids do. I, I, I wasn't squeaky clean, you know, but nothing big deal problems. And I just always worked. I was a workaholic until, until I moved here in Anderson. Is there any one thing that you learned in, in the Navy that you said that, that carried, carried over and helped you become a success in civilian life? Just be good to others. Just help one another. Be friendly. Don't carry a grudge. So a sense of teamwork, camaraderie, get the mission done. It's easier to have friends than enemies. Exactly. Um, if a young man were to come to you today and recommend or ask, um, is it worth my time to, to go into the military, be it the Navy, Air Force, uh, what would be your advice to them? Depending on what this young man is doing, if he's got a job or a business or whatever it is, but if he's like free and clear, I would recommend it because you've got the opportunity to choose a school now when you go into the service. And I think it'd be a great opportunity for young kids that are growing up with nothing to do and just roaming the streets. You grow up to be a man, believe me, you, can, you learn a lot, respect, courtesy, and everything else. So uh, just a, a positive opportunity if you're willing to grasp it. Absolutely. Well, Norm, it, it's certainly been my pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you very much for your service. I appreciate the talk. 
if I talk a little funny, a little, I'm very nervous. I've never been in an interview before. Oh, you no, you were, you you sound fine. I'm from Boston. I'm the one that talks funny. For SCA TV, I'm Steve McCurry. Okay. Good.